So good afternoon. Um, my name is Carl Heckering and a uh, longtime nerd. Uh, from the earliest days of the web, David Weinberger has been a pioneering thought leader in the technology's effect on our lives, our businesses, and most of all, on our ideas. He's contributed to a remarkable range of fields from marketing, libraries, politics, journalism, to education, to the impact and meaning of AI and more. With a PhD from the University of Toronto, many years as a freelance journalist and humor writer, and a six year stint as a philosophy professor, David's twisty path took a sharp turn into a job as a marketing writer for a high tech startup. That put him in a position to observe and participate in the early rise of the World Wide Web. In 1999, he was co-author of a seminal work on the internet business and marketing, The Clue Train Manifesto. His most recent book, The Award-Winning Everyday Chaos, by Harvard Business Review Press in 2019, presents a unique perspective on the rise and importance of machine learning. His work has been published many times by Wired, Harvard Business Review, Scientific American, New York Times, Washington Post, and others. Given many keynote speeches around the world and most recently on ethics and how, what ethics can learn from AI and the shift our most ancient strategies in thriving as citizens and business people. On a personal note, David and I have known of each other for about 25 years as members of a email discussion group formed by a uh, mutual friend. In 2012, I went to a book signing uh, that David was holding at Harvard. Uh, it was his latest book, too big to know, and we you know, I listened to the uh, presentation and uh, heard the examples of you know, samples from the book, and then uh, met him at the table and said, "How do we sign this?" Uh, and we we had a good laugh. Um, I left and have continued to follow David's writing. Uh, have, have we become friends in present. Um, and getting ready for this presentation. And so with that, I ask um, that you greet David Weinberger. Uh, okay. Um, thank you, Rick. Thank you, Carl. Th thank you. Um, what Carl didn't mention is the look on his face when I scratched my initials into his tablet. Um, which are still there, I think. I like to. Th I hope they are. Um, so I see what the title I gave this talk back months ago when I was really happy to get the invitation. That's not the title anymore. The topic is roughly the same. Um, uh, it, the title now is The World According to AI. That's one title, which is a big promise, and I'm not going to deliver on it, but I promise you that. Um, and the alternative title is um, uh, complicating things. Uh, and I mean that in two cents. Uh, I think it's really important to complicate things. And second of all, things are really complicated. And this is something I think that we are discovering um, through, through AI in a way that we can't uh, ignore. So um, I, I have been accused at times of being a techno-determinist because I've written about tech for, you know, for a long time. He was an early advocate uh, for the web, as some of the <clears throat> older, uh, senior, the wiser, more experienced people were early advocates for an open web. Um, and part of the reason why I would be called a techno-determinist uh, was because I was pretty convinced that the rise of the web and the culture and ethos of it were inevitable, would sweep away old institutions inevitably. So techno-determinism, depending on, so I went to Carl's really excellent session with a, a great packed room that um, was very involved in the conversation. Um, the, the, I take techno-determinism as meaning um, somebody who believes that tech, simply the use of technology will shape how you think and how you act. There are very few people who claim to be a techno-determinist who, who positively claim that because it's a really difficult notion to defend. It 
takes away, it seems to take away human agency. Um, I, I, so in some sense, um, I was because as an, or, or, well, I was certainly taken for one because I was, as I say, an advocate for the web as if the web would sweep everything away with an inevitability, which is what really put me uh, classified into the determinist camp. Um, but I, I wasn't a techno-determinist. I just didn't know what I was because it was clear to me that tech doesn't have that sort of power over us. But yet I felt there was an inevitability, which I think in some ways was correct, but obviously the web has not be, become the uh, purely positive liberating force that um, many of us hoped it would be. Um, it took me a long time to realize that uh, the inevitability that I felt, and many of my cohort felt as well, uh, frequently in obnoxious ways, was not due to the tech, but rather to a sense about uh, what humans, what's at the core of being a human being, another arrogant sort of statement to make. But I, I should tell you, that, you know, I, I have been a philosopher, so I, I feel entitled to make broad sweeping and ultimately meaningless and evidenceless, um, as you'll see, statements. But it wasn't, so I finally realized it was not the tech that, that was giving me the sense of inevitability, but rather the sense that People who were able to, were using the web, who were able to use the web, were there for very, very human reasons. It, it wasn't because we wanted to be marketed to more efficiently. It was because we wanted to connect with people. Um, so I'm talking in the early days, or 90s through 2000, something like that. We wanted to connect with people, and we wanted to talk with people about what mattered to us, not what other forces were interest, interested in telling us we should care about, and to speak in our own voice. And that seemed so fundamental to me such a fundamental urge that that was what was giving me the sense of inevitability of the web. About 10 years after that, I learned and was grateful to, uh, um, yeah, that sort of thing that I just said, that's the sort of thing that you know, privileged people say. It's when you have enough time and luxury that you are concerned primarily with those aspects, important though they are. The fundamental problem I have with techno-determinism is that it's way, way too simple. It postulates a simple, basically causal relationship between humans and machines, and that can't be right. But I do now want to defend a type of techno-determinism. I'm not even going to defend it. I'm, well, I'll tell you what it is. And then the rest of the talk is about that. So um, it seems to me, and not only to me, that ages understand themselves in their world through their dominant technology. Not only, but in important ways, tech seems to, uh, the dominant tech seems to set the, the model, the framework for how we understand ourselves. And you can take this back at least to the 17th century. I think there's a very good argument for take, taking it back to, this, to the 7th century BCE, but at least you know 1600s, which is sort of the Enlightenment uh, is beginning. And people have a sense, an explicit sense, that the universe is a clockwork, a clockwork universe. This was before Newton discovered the laws of the clockwork, 1687, roughly, when he published his book, uh, the book of, anyway. Um, and what, I mean, why? Because in some sense, clocks and watches were the dominant marvel of the, they were the chat GPT of the 1600s. They were unbelievably complex and exquisitely precise. They were, they were the marvels of the time, and I don't know if you care about watches, but if you do, they are mind-blowing, just like we say about ChatGPT. They don't, didn't seem to be capable of being made by humans. The model that they gave us, that we took from them, so that's the difference between techno-determinism and saying that we took it, but it's basically the same thing. The, the model that we took from them was a universe that works, that consists of many small parts and some large parts, each of which is working and affected by all others according to simple rules. We can see the mechanism. We can know how it works. And this was even before Newton gave us laws that were universal and simple enough for us to understand and explain the mechanics of the universe. It was astounding. And so this tech prepped us for this. The, the clocks prepped us for this. And in the same way, you can go through um, steam engines, excuse me, and uh, telephones and telegraphs, et cetera, each of, whom each of which had important ways of molding our minds about how we think about the world. Notice how techno-determinist that sounds. I think it's a mystery how this happens. Um, I don't think it's, I think it's really complicated. So that's why I 
like to think I'm not a pure techno-determinist. Um, but you know, so clockwork in the 17th century, to skip ahead now, um, to the 20th and, 20th and 21st, computers come along, everything starts. Within a couple of years, it's incredibly fast. I mean, it's not ChatGPT fast, but the transformation was over the course of like two or three years. Everything started to look like information. Everything started to look like an information process. Everything started to look like an information processor. And this has continued. We still have a lot of the computer metaphors in our, in our brains. Um, internet, everything started to look like, uh, look like a network, you know, which in many ways, from my point of view, was great because it gave an image of a distribute, of distribution of power and, as well as of um, function. Um, and that is also still with us. These things hang around for a while. I'm not sad about that one. Um, go back to the 16th century. I want to spend, uh, 17th century, I want to spend one minute on that because uh, it will provide a contrast. So in the 17th century and then in, at least for a few centuries after that, during, I'll leave it there, um, there was a strong sense that the world was extremely orderly, as orderly as a watch, but in terms of sort of the taxonomy of things, there was a, a given, usually God-given, but there was a given taxonomy how things go together. And that taxonomy was perfect in, in theory. It was a perfect taxonomy. It covered everything. Nothing was in two branches. That couldn't happen because this was a 2D taxonomy. And it made sense. It, and we still, you know, our, our genus species, which we got from Linnaeus in the 18th century, very much a product of that. Every animal has to be in one spot. And if we come across an animal that doesn't, like a duck-billed platypus, at the time when the platypus was discovered, that is, it was taken from Australia and brought to the Royal Society in England, it, it was written off as a hoax. Couldn't possibly be a mammal that lays eggs, because that would be in two, two boxes in the taxonomy, and that cannot be. It's simple, the world is simple, it's orderly, um, it, it's fully explicable. You can look at the taxonomy to see where things are. Um, well, you know, we graduated out of that, and certainly with the web, the internet and the web, rather um, dramatically. Uh, the internet is a play, it's the internet, it's a, it's a web. Um, this is the first time I've ever given a talk using cards. I got them out of order. <sighs> Completely predictable. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. I now discovered on the bottom of the slide of, of card two, something I should have said. Oh, God. OK. Um, when you look at what things were in that first era, the, the Enlightenment era, you can get a sense of this from what is probably the most famous anecdote in the history of Western philosophy. And everything I'm saying is within Western culture. Uh, it's my limitation. Um, where there was a, an important philosopher named Bishop Berkeley, and stop me if you've heard this before, but I'm going to go ahead and tell it anyway. Uh, Bishop Berkeley, who believed that his, his philosophical position was that there is no real world. There is, however, a God, which was commonly taken for granted. There's a God who is feeding us sensations and perceptions that are what we would get if there was a real world. But we don't need the real world because God is perfectly capable of giving us these, these perceptions and doing so in a very coherent way. And so the uh, uh, British um, dictionary maker and man about town, Dr. Johnson, was asked about Barclay's theory. And he, found, he was out walking and he found a, a nice rock around here and he kicked it um, and said, I refute him thus which is a terrible refu refutation because Barclay, of course, would say, oh, okay, so you mean that God gave you the perception of having a badly stubbed toe, congratulations, but you have proven nothing. It's not a good refutation. But it does give us an important clue about what that age took as real, what counts as real, and what the issue of reality was settled by kicking a material object that did not bend to our will. Reality meant real, uh, reality meant matter, material. And since the theme of what I'm talking about is 
uh, going from simplicity to complexity, that is way, way too simple. That looks at the one thing that all real things have in common, and that they are material one way or another, and it ignores everything else about things, about the world. So the world is made of things. It's a gigantic oversimplification. I'm going to learn not to hold these. I know you're very interested in this. I'm going to put them down. Ah, oh, excellent. Um, so now let's jump, um, hmm, too far ahead. Let's jump way ahead. Yeah, OK. So um, throughout this period, and for thousands, in fact, for, for is a truly a Paleolithic idea that we've carried around and still have with us, which is our strategy of strategies, certainly in place in the 17th century, which is uh, our, our strategy is to anticipate what's going to happen and then to prepare for it. And I mean this very, very simply. So if in sort of cave times, if the weather's getting nice, you anticipate that the birds will be coming back, and so you better craft some, some arrows or spears or whatever. Right? Anticipate and prepare. We do this all the time, everywhere. We will always continue to because we don't want to go outside and get rained on because we did not anticipate um, the rain. So this will stay with us. but. It's also changing. So let me give you an, a positive example of anticipating and preparing. Then we're going to talk about the internet, where something else happens. So 1908, uh, Henry Ford is um, planning the Model T, you know, the, the car that started the car revolution. So he took 15 of his best engineers. He sequestered them and him in a 25 by 25 square foot room for eight months. And they planned out this car. They anticipated what the market wanted so perfectly that they sold 15 million of them over the course of 19 years, basically without ever making a change. Uh, you know, find a piece of software that comes anywhere close to that. You probably can, but I can't at the moment anyway. This is how anticipating and prepare works at its best. And Henry Ford was a genius of this. He, uh, he was a marketing genius. He was also not just a Nazi supporter, he actually provided physical aid to the Nazis and was a rabid, rabid, not a rabid, he was a rabid anti-Semite and a complete prick. But he was really good at anticipating and preparing. Okay, so let's jump ahead to the internet where we start to see a different strategy. Um, so it, uh, in 2001, the um, MVP, the minimum viable product was invented. Are you familiar with this? Some nods, mainly. Um, I won't check the demographics, but OK. This is a very popular way and successful way of launching things on the internet. Um, the idea is you, instead of doing the Henry Ford thing and anticipating, you instead find the one feature that you think people will pay for, and you launch it with that. So Dropbox did this. Uh, Dropbox launched as a continuous, invisible, backup. Um, and then you, people pay you for it, and they use it. And you see how they use it, what doesn't work, what they want, what they're complaining about, what the reviews say, what the conversations online say, and so forth. And from this, you learn what they want. You learn what new features. You don't have to anticipate. You can, you can learn. This is, and it works really, really well. Lots of companies have done this because it's, it's safe, and it ends up with products that do better in the market rather than trying to anticipate and prepare. But in, in fact, many of the products and services um, that we take as emblematic of the internet are also ones that try not to anticipate, going against thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years of the anticipate and prepare strategy. So uh, agile programming is, or development is one I think a clear example of this, where you're ready to um, turn and pivot, you stay very close to the current conditions. Uh, open source, open access, um, game mods, which go back to 1981. You've just spent, your company has just spent $100 million developing a AAA game, and you, you let your users change it. And this drives games entirely, like Minecraft and Roblox. This is how they, this is how they work. You, you give them a full game, but you, uh, you don't insist on anticipating. You let them um, make of it what, what they want. 
Um, the, uh, when the iPhone launched, uh, it didn't really have features that weren't in prior um, phones. It was elegant and beautiful, but a year after it launched, they introduced the App Store, and the app, app stores in general are a great example of unanticipating. You, you say, we've put together a great app, it's full, it's complete, you'll love it, worth the money, but we cannot anticipate what everybody's gonna want to do with this thing. We just can't, and if we could, we couldn't build all that stuff. So they put in the App Store, and then they have millions of applications that extend beyond their vision or their capability. This is, extreme, I don't, this is extremely common now. We're all familiar with this sort of thing. Um, likewise, open APIs are transformative of various industries, because they enable anybody on the internet to use your product as a set of services and to integrate with it, to extend it, to develop entirely new apps. Um, this goes all the way to the heart of the internet. This is the found, this in fact is arguably the founding idea of the internet. In 1984, there was a paper written by Saltzer, Reed, and yeah, that third guy. Um, at my age, I'm lucky to remember two, okay? <laughs> Jeez. Um, Clark is the third guy. Oh, you knew that already. See, it takes two people of a certain age to remember the two names of any one individual or the three names on a paper. So, thank you. Um, the end-to-end -end, um, uh, end -end argument in system design, which is about the internet, says, uh, should we build a security system into the internet? Because people, some people are going to want that. Should we build in a search engine? Because a lot of people are going to want that. This is 1984, right? It's well before the, the web. Um, and their argument is, no, we should not optimize the internet for any one particular set of uses or any particular set of feature, features. We should just make sure that it is fantastic at getting bits, moving bits around with some degree of certainty that they're arriving where they're arriving. Anything else, any optimization of it that we do will de-optimize it for other purposes. And we don't want to do that because we don't know what the purposes are. In the modern world, over the past 10 years, or 20 years at this point, I guess, this is um, net neutrality, is trying to preserve the same sort of openness in a slightly different context. So this, this refusal to anticipate and prepare goes all the way to the origins and heart of the internet and is emblematic of much of what, um, of much of the internet, and I suspect in this room, much of what we love about the internet, for all of our misgivings about, about the internet. Well, in the world of the internet, right, so this is the second world. The first world was the 17th century. In the second world which is, of this talk, which is the internet, there's no taxonomy. <laughs> I mean, uh, there's an extremely messy web in which nodes are in multiple categories, that is, connected to multiple, multiple things, and you can taxonomize those nodes in any way you want, and within any one particular page, you can taxonomize whatever you want, however you want it. You, put, you don't have to pick one category. If you're a bookseller, uh, you don't have to say, well, okay, this is a, <clears throat> a book about uh, the music of the military throughout history. Well, is it a history book, a music book, or a military book? You don't have to choose. All three. And you can let your users add their own tags of various forms so that the taxonomy, this multidimensional taxonomy, reflects their needs as well. It makes it very, very complex. It also makes it very, very rich. Um, and it, you end up uh, with, a, with an open, relatively open world. Now, so, uh, Carl's session, much of the discussion was about the way that it's been closed off by the forces, uh, large corporations and the like, which is very, very true. There still is an open infrastructure for it, though, which gets drowned out by the larger, increasingly awful. Um, major infrastructure, excuse me. <clears throat> but the internet by itself is complex and messy and does not adhere to, um, to anticipating and preparing. It's co you can see its complexity if you need any, and I don't think you do. It's complex to the point of inexplicability in many uh, uses. So I'll just give you two really quickly. One is A-B testing. You know A-B testing? Where if you're going to advertise, you put up two versions, minor differences, and just see which one gets 2% more clicks, and then you use that one. Red background, green background, model on the left, model on the right. 
there's no, there's no science that I know of, of AB that you can use, you can get rid of the AB testing because now we have generalizations that say, oh, if it's a barbecue ad, always put the model on the right or whatever it is. It's just cheaper and easier and more effective. Just run the AB test. See which one gets 2% more clicks then you'll make a little more money. We don't need the theory in an environment, often when an environment like the internet. Um, and the second example I'd give of the complexity and inexplicability of the internet is uh, the virality of what, you know, what goes viral, why? Uh, everybody, so remember the ice bucket challenge? So this, if you don't, this raised $150 million for a very good research charity. And the idea was you, put, you take a bucket of ice water, you pour it over your head, you uh, donate money, you announce your don do donation to this charity, and you challenge somebody. I call you, Carl, in my video. I post a video. $150 million swept the globe. Um, but it, it is, if you think about it, the dumbest idea in history. If you were on the team that's trying to come up with a way to raise money for this very worthy charity, and somebody at the end of you know, a full day of brainstorming said, you know, we could have people dump ice water on their head and donate money and challenge somebody else, everybody, else would, everybody would laugh. Say, oh, yeah, that, that is really dumb. Thank you for that. <laughs> Turns out it's wildly effective. This was. What do you learn from this about how to make something go viral? Nothing, basically nothing. It's not that, oh, be as stupid as you can. That's not, there is no rule. And when the CEOs around the world see the success of this thing, they go to their marketing departments and say, you know what we need? We need an ice bucket challenge. The marketing department, if it has any sense, tries to explain, we don't know how to make things go viral. Nobody knows that. Everybody would like to. It's not a reasonable request. The internet is largely inexplicable. OK, um, ah, so what do things look like in world two, which is the internet? Um, they are things that the, the, the emblematic things of the internet are things that do not, they're not matter, first of all, they're clearly not matter, but they don't have any of the properties of matter. They don't reduce the, the lowest common denominator. denominator. Maybe what they have in common is that they don't try to anticipate and prepare, or at least they're not fully beholden to that strategy. More typically, the things on the internet that make the internet the internet and that we think about when we're thinking about the internet are things that refuse to anticipate and set their hearts on opening up possibilities to make more possible, whether that's a new programming framework or it's, um, it's archive.org, which has this fantastic uh, collection. If you're, if you're um, are researching AI, that's where you go. It's open, open access um, and just waiting for you. The stuff that we care about on the internet refuses to anticipate and does everything it can to open up more possibilities. That makes things on the internet way more complex than the rock that Dr. Johnson um, kicked his foot against. Okay, third world um, that I'm going to talk about is AI. So when talking to audiences, which I sometimes do, uh, which are not as technically, to business audiences, who I have to assume, and usually correctly, they have an extremely vague idea of what AI is. And so I, I'm going to, I, I try to explain it to them really briefly, and I'm going to do it to you, not because you don't know what it is, but because I'm trying to frame what's going to come next, okay? So I sometimes say to them, uh, <clears throat> every, I'm now imitating myself, every machine learning, I never do that. Every machine learning project begins with a surrender, and it ends with a sacrifice. And I think they sort of, Sort of, so that's dramatic, and I think they sort of like it because they think I'm going to be very negative about, the inter about AI, but I'm not going to be. Um, and so that, I, here's how I then explain it to them. Um, what's the surrender? Well, in 2022, in January, there was a paper written by researchers at the University of Leeds about a model they had trained on uh, retinal scans and on very basic health record information all anonymized, but it was really basic stuff, the sort of readings they take when you go for your health exam, um, your cholesterol and weight and so forth. Um, 
but also have you had a heart experience? Have you had a heart attack? Any sort of heart problem? So they trained it on those two sets of data. And it turns out that in the, it's, it was only 5,600 people, right? And I doubt very much that they worried about um, making sure that it was a representative group of people. Nevertheless, um, it, it's a promising, it's certainly a promising result. They say at the end of it, um, we think that this is promising enough that we can envision a day when you'll go in for your eye, normal eye exam and they'll also tell you whether you're going to have a heart attack. And that would be nice if you could bring it down to that level. So as far as I, I'm not an expert, as far as I can tell, the research is, is solid. Um, but nobody, all that we did was give it data. All right, data in the form of images, obviously pixels, and data in the form of numbers on health records. And in typical fashion, we didn't tell the AI what the, uh, what the numbers represented. It's just not in the system. It's just buckets of numbers. Uh, and we let it do the car look for correlations, small correlations, big correlations. And what didn't we do? We did not tell the system anything that we know about hearts, circulatory systems, retinas, nothing. And we have spent decades, centuries, in some senses, thousands of years, compiling knowledge about how these things work. We know a lot about hearts. We know a lot about et cetera. We didn't tell the system anything like that. We just kept mum, which seems really unwise. Why, we, why did we surrender all human information? I mean, literally all human information except data that you know, encodes something. And the answer, I think, is really simple. It's because we wanted to see things that we can't. Our knowledge, which tends to be knowledge of general principles, of, because uh, facts are about individual things. Knowledge is broader. It's drawing generalizations, un, uh, universals at best. That's the highest form of knowledge. Throughout Western history, we have looked up for knowledge, for certainty. That's in the grand principles. I mean, literally up for the Greeks. That's where they thought the, the truth was. And we've looked at the world of particulars as just too messy. It's not, knowledge is what you make of them, but that, the particulars are not particularly important. So we, we surrender all of that and instead go with particulars in AI. So it will see what we cannot. It, it, it sees these things in two ways. I mean, lots of ways, but for my purposes, there are two that I want to focus on um, briefly. One is MI, uh, machine learning models tend to be multidimensional. Um, I'm going to give you, uh, you probably all know this much better than I do, but I'm going to go ahead. Uh, I'm going to frame it my way and don't laugh. So the standard example in this case seems to be, for some reason, if you want to price to explain multidimensionality, if you want to pr uh, come up with the right price to sell your house at, what should you offer it at, um, you could do a, do a little graph. And uh, on the vertical axis would be price, and on the horizontal would be number of bedrooms. And that will tell you something. But you also probably want to know uh, there's some dependency on how many bathrooms. and. Uh, is, there, uh, is there parking? Is there a driveway? How many cars? Is there a yard, a front yard? What shape is it in? Is there a pool? Is there a barbecue? Is there, is there a fireplace? How many fireplaces, if you're so lucky? How near is it to a school? You can go on, easily come up with 100 different dimensions, things that you could measure the, uh, the house um, along. And if you did all that and then smushed them into one, one chart, it wouldn't make any sense to you. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to read it. You cannot read a hundred-dimensional chart. You may be able to read a three-dimensional, four. You cannot read a hundred-dimensional chart. And of course, AI deals, in some instances, with way, way, way more than a hundred dimensions. So being multi-dimensional is one, one of the things that leads to uh, machine learning often, I'm going to say by default, being inexplicable to humans. It's not always. I know there's a tremendous amount of work to try to get over what, this very important uh, problem, but it's also a source of AI's accuracy and its, its depth is that it can handle more dimensions that, than we can. Um, second thing I would want to point to, which is part of the theme, is that um, 
AI does this by looking at particulars and noting what may be small patterns which affect outcomes in a small way, but you put them together and now you've got clues like Sherlock Holmes that say, oh yeah, it's probably not the butler, it's probably the least likely you know, candidate over here who did it. It pays attention to particulars. It generalizes in that it's looking for these patterns, but it doesn't generalize the way that we want. Um, generalizations hide too much. Saying that things are matter hides too much. It's true, but it hides too much. It's too simple. So why do we do that? Why do we let, sorry, why do we withhold everything we know except the data that we provide it? And in parentheses, there are important reasons why we choose the data that we do. There is some knowledge behind that, and there's also almost always some level of bias behind it as well. Nevertheless, we don't tell it what we know because we want it to see what we cannot. And we don't want our knowledge in this instance becomes a hindrance to advancing our knowledge. It gets in the way at this level. Sacrifice, remember surrender and sacrifice, the sacrifice is understanding, um, which is a great loss practically, especially when we're concerned about the fairness of the outcomes or the accuracy. Um, but we get results that we can more or less often test and seem to be helpful in many instances. That's why we use AI. If it's not, then we shouldn't be using it. Um, but it, we can't understand it because it's not generalizing. Now, you know if you know more about AI than I do, which is virtually all of you, I'm sure, that yeah, of course AI generalizes. If, if, it, if it doesn't, then it's overfit. It, can, it only works on what it was trained on. It doesn't work on, on anything in the world, and that's no good. It has to be able to generalize. And yes, of course, in that sense, it generalizes. But the generali generalizations that the models make are so small and so particular and so complex, so mathematically complex, that we can't understand them. And the gen those generalizations don't do what we in the West have wanted generalizations to always do, which is to be simple enough for us to understand them, and uh, thus we can use them to explain things. And here we have generalizations, wildly complex, we can't understand them, and thus we can't even use them to explain how the machine model, learning model, came up with its output. This is, it's also a blow to our species' pride, because in the West, for thousands of years, we have prided ourselves. It's a, our spot in the taxonomy has been the rational animals since the Greeks, that we're, we are the ones who can understand the world. Well, not, we are no longer the, um, we are now getting our knowledge from a machine that does not understand the world but it has data that allows it to find patterns and small generalizations. It allows particulars to speak. And that for me is gonna be the most important thing. Okay, so I wanna give you two examples of what the world looks like. I'm afraid to look at the time. Hmm, okay, um, two examples of what it, assume for the moment that machine learning is going to shape our idea about the world and ourselves the way that those other technologies have done historically. And this is pure speculation, right? I, it's way too early in the process in AI's history to start talking this way. But I've mentioned that my background's in philosophy, so I have license to do this, I'm sorry. So um, first is morality. So uh, in the West, for a very long time, we've approached morality by finding frameworks. And these frameworks are things like religious morality, where you look to your religion and your God for the moral statements um, and principles. Uh, uh, principle-based uh, morality, usually associated with Immanuel Kant, but you know, a set of principles that are not founded in religion but founded in reason. Um, utilitarianism, which has a universal methodology that you apply, and these are, and, and then you, once you have adopted your framework, you can then put your moral quandaries, your dilemmas, underneath that and see what it would say. Except it doesn't work. It's never worked. We, we have, we can agree on our principles, but when it goes to apply them, we disagree. It happens all the time. That's why we're still arguing 70 years, 70 years after the um, Equal Opportunity Act 
in the U.S. We're still arguing about how it applies. We still have Supreme Court controversies about horrendous Supreme Court decisions about uh, diversity issues, even though we agreed somehow on this thing. We don't, frameworks don't do the job that we want them to. We want them to settle moral problems, but they don't. So I, I want to give you a ridiculously simplified um, moral issue. You have three friends, A, B, and C. All four of you know each other. A comes to you one day and says, oh, I can't believe what C just said to me or did to me. I thought she was my friend. I'm so angry. I'm never going to speak to her again. <gasps> Don't tell anybody I said that. And you agree. You've made a promise. And with the um, coincidence of a hypothesis, very next hour you run into friend C. And C is just so happy because C has been planning their wedding and figuring out the seating arrangements, which is something that Americans do and apparently not all countries do. But it, we try to get everybody placed at the right seat for maximum social enjoyment. And C says to you, it was driving me crazy. I finally worked it out. It's done. I've actually managed to get A and C at the same, I'm sorry, A and B at the same table. And you know that A is really angry at B. So what do you do? What do you do? You don't know. I'm not even going to ask. I don't know, you don't know, because you, you don't know the particulars. It's one thing if A does this all the time and then it gets over it. A, that's a different situation. That particular will change everything about it. Or um, A will never forgive you for breaking a promise. Or A would understand. Or A and B, even if they're angry at each other, they would never disrupt the wedding. They're not going to actually manifest it. Or maybe they will. Maybe. Uh, and you're going to break a promise? Will A forgive you for that? How will C feel if C finds out and there's a A and B go at it at the wedding and C finds out that you knew and you, you didn't tell them about it? So what are you going to do? It depends on the particulars. And if you resolve this issue, as you will one way or another, um, if the next week you face pretty much exactly the same situation, except it's with D, E, and F, what you did in the first case, it's not going to help you figure out what to do in the second case, because the second case is also particular. The really uh, the important and really awesome philosopher, uh, Martha, Martha Nussbaum, in a 1999 book, very, I, I like the title a lot, it's Love's Knowledge. She talks about this in terms of the incommensurability of moral situations. That is, they, they're all particular. You can't just stamp them out. That is, you know, one after another. Um, and that seems to me, that really struck home with me. Um, and I, th I, think it's, I think it's true. What this tells you is that particulars really matter. Generalizations are often really helpful, of course. Universal laws. But they're not enough. And in many cases, they don't help. I mean, the law of gravity is a pretty good law. I'm not going to argue against Newton on this, but it doesn't work if you're trying to figure out where a single piece of confetti, which I found out is called a confetto, if it's the, you know, the big parade and you want to know where this one piece is going to land, you know that gravity is going to play a big part in it, but there are too many particulars. You, you're not going to be able to figure it out if the guy, play, uh, person, playing the tuba in the marching band passes by and blares out a note, that's going to change where that confetto falls. So uh, universals are really important. Particulars have been, we have not paid enough attention to them. We have not let them have a voice. We haven't, in some sense, let them have their dignity. They have a role to play. They're equally as important as the, as the true generalizations. OK, the, and the, sorry, the second um, example of what it's like to live in the framework, so to speak, that um, AI may be giving us, this change in how we think about the world and ourselves, is sim simulation theory. I won't call on you. How many of you are, know what the simulation theory or hypothesis is? All right, it's a good smattering. It's really simple. Um, simulation theory says, there is no way for us to tell whether we here right now are living in a computer simulation. And some of the supporters of it go on to say, however, uh, it's very likely that we are. 
And people don't like the simulation theory, generally, personally. Most people don't want to believe it, I think, for two reasons. One is nobody wants to think that their life is determined by alien teenagers, or any teenagers. Now, that I'm not really, it's a teenager who has programmed me to do that. We don't want to believe that. The second thing is it feels phony, because this is a thing that I think is a real thing, going back to world one, because it's made out of matter. And if I'm in a simulation, I'm in Bishop Barclay's world, right? Because there isn't really a thing. There's only a teenage alien god who's giving me, at the, the simulated me, the sensations of there being a thing. Likewise, none of you are, are what you think you are either in a simulated world. And that, that annoys people. I, I, understand, <laughs> I understand why. But I think there's something else at stake as well. Um, so I want to give you a different example of, of, of a thing. It's, well, it's always surprising to me how important examples are. There's so much, so many things ride upon the examples that you choose. So um, here's an example. You are walking, it's, it's a pleasant day. You are out walking and you pass by uh, a body of water, a lake, a pond, whatever. And without really thinking about it, you, you reach down and you pick up a rock. And once it's in your hand, a memory forms. It's as if your hand in that rock is forming a, a, a memory. The rock is pretty smooth, it's a particular weight, it feels a little wet on the bottom from being in the ground. And the memory comes back to you. And the memory is of when you were five years old. And you were at a lake, really pleasant day, it's a wonderful memory. And there's your eight-year-old cousin, who was also at the lake next to you. And she picked up a rock, much like the one that you now have in your hand. And then she did something that absolutely blew your mind, your five-year-old mind. She picked up the rock, nice flat rock. You maybe can see where this is going. And she went and ta -ta 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 -ta. bounces seven times off the water. And on the eighth, it sinks into the water. This is, this is the chat GPT of your childhood. It just blows, it does not make sense. Because what do you know about water as a five-year-old? You know it is the thing that accepts anything you put into it. You step into water, it doesn't push back, unlike Dr. Johnson's rock. It accepts you. It not only accepts you, it, it, it touches you all, all, whatever part you put in, it's going to surround you. It's going to encase you more tightly than a shirt or a warm jacket. That's what it does. That's water. And what do you know about rocks? You know a few things, but one of them very likely is it's a really good example of something that doesn't float, despite Monty Python. You put it in, it's going to fall. What did you just see? You just saw water not accept a rock, a rock for God's sake. It didn't accept it. It bounced it off of it. And you also thereby learn that water has a hard surface, which makes no sense because it's still just water. And it's not even a stable surface. It's, you know, it's rippling or whatever. But it has a surface so hard, this thing that accepts everything that it's given, that it bounces the rock off of it. And what do you learn about the rock? The thing that is a good example of something that sinks. You learn, not water, not with water. It'll bounce until finally it is accepted. This should not happen, but it does, and it's delightful. Because in the world, the world of things, things reveal themselves to other things. They're not a tax, a taxonomy has, taxonomies are useful, et cetera. Um, this is not a taxonomic relationship between water and rock. This is rock and water exposing, revealing something about themselves that you wouldn't see apart from those two. It's not even, and I'm not sure this is right. Did I tell you this is all a work in process? OK, progress. Um, I'm not sure that the following is right. I'm not sure it's even helpful to talk about properties of things. This is not to say they don't have determinate ways to interact with things. But you only see or care about those properties when a thing is interacting with something else. You know, pencil eraser has the property of erasing pencils, OK. But that is an interaction between the two of them. And it's good to know that the things have these possibilities, those, these potentials. But they're potentials for interacting, for interoperating with other things. Things reveal themselves as what they are, not just matter, 
so far removed from matter, well, of course, still being matter, in how they interact with the rest of the world. And those interactions are themselves dependent upon a full set of relationships among the things of the world. The water, the lake, the shore, the sky, your cousin, all of it. You see this in, uh, really, uh, you see this in cooking. If you, if you, if you, frequently in cooking, at least in my experience, I find out about properties of things in relation to other things that I didn't know they had. For one reason or another, perhaps a recipe told me to, or a friend said, you know what, you should try putting uh, uh, red wine vinegar on and then name something. And you say, oh, that's not, but it turns out, red wine and apples, I'm just making it up, turn out to be delicious together. When they're, that's things revealing themselves um, mutually. And that seems to me is much of what our world is about. So what does this have to do with um, AI? What I just described, I think, in some ways, taking, taking a machine learning model as a metaphor, the same way that once we took pocket watches as a metaphor for the universe, which seems like a real stretch, but it, it's a beautiful metaphor for it, do the same sort of thing. It's not a precise one-to-one -one thing. They're different. I mean, clocks and the universe are really different in many, many ways, starting with they have to be wound up. What I've just described, a world in which things reveal themselves based upon how they meet other things, does not sound much like a machine learning model, but I think in some important ways it is. And it may be something, I hope, that we take from machine learning models, which is here you have a rock that it doesn't have an essence. It doesn't have a, a, a single shelf that gets put on. It, it doesn't have a tax. You can always you can make up lots of taxonomies, and some are very useful, but it doesn't naturally have a taxonomy. It has a set of relationships to lots and lots of other things in the model, in the world. And those relationships are incredibly particular. In fact, the relationship to rock to water, think of them as, as um, points in a knowledge graph or um, in a in, in, in an embedding. It's not just a relationship, it's a particular relationship that exposes something special about each of them. The rock as a node, forget that. Um, it's unnecessarily complicated, uh, confusing to me. So it seems to me that there is a similarity between how we experience things in the world and how we how they get portrayed, how they get embedded in the machine learning model. If we start learning about machine learning models, and it depends upon what, um, how we get taught, then it seems possible to me in a speculative way that the path that we've been on for the past few hundred years of allowing things to assume their natural complexity, we will continue down in a pretty radical way it's a way in which we hold on to generalizations, recognize their utility, and there's lots of utility to them, but at long last, we also allow particulars to have a voice. This seems to me to be, to make the world into a mystery. We don't know all of what the rock will expose, all of its properties, all the properties of things that it interacts with. So the world seems to me in this light to be a mystery that we, continuously solve as we walk around and we interact with things, but we can't possibly, possibly ever resolve finally. And I would be very happy if that's what we came out thinking of the world as this revolution, the AI, <clears throat> excuse me, AI revolution continues and as the AI age grows. Thank you. I don't know what time it is. Five minutes. Oh, geez, I'm so sorry. I would be happy to take any of your yes or no questions. <laughs> Whoever, 
Will you take me out of the hot seat by choosing people? Sorry. Uh, go ahead. Early on, you talked about techno determinism as being that um, technology affects, oh. determine, affects the way we perceive the world. So you have to be a yes or no question. Yes. <laughs> Keep going. Is that sort of like language? It is so like language. That's part I left out. It is, it, it, that is exact, and I think it's actually a crucial step. Because it's exactly, in my view, and not just my view, how language works. That words, we don't learn words by definition. We learn through prototypical examples. Um, and we can muster a definition usually when we need to, but often when we can't. If I ask you what skipping is, it's a tough one. You all know what it is. It's really hard to define. Um, if I ask you what a vehicle is, I can come up with examples where you say, well, I'm not sure whether it fits the definition. And not because I'm clever, it's just that's how language is. Language consists of a set of relationships among a vast embedding space of words, if you want, in which they have their meaning by their, in their relationship to those other words. That is not a finite set of relationships, and it's exactly the same, in my view, how things, the things of the world work as well. I mean, text, you know, text embeddings have, I think, many of the properties that I was pointing to. That too, and those two things are not, so they have, the comparison you were going for was they both affect our view of the world. Yes, basically everything affects our view of the world, including our parents and choice of TV shows. But language is a huge determinant, uh, framework. Um, but from my point of view, the way that it determines it is by putting us into that network of how things go together. The fact that we have wood and lumber for basically the same thing, and trees, et cetera, et cetera, organizes in a loose way what the meanings of those words are, but also how we think about the world. It's a, wor a world in which we cut down trees and we make, uh, turn it into lumber and make things. Um, the philosopher Martin Heidegger, another, another Nazi, by the way, uh, did say some true things also. Uh, and one of them was this, basically what I just said about the nature of language that it is a relational network which only has meaning in its, in its relationships. And from that we can withdraw and make up definitions, but that's not, not the natural state of language. And he considered language to be the most important determinant, too strong a word, determinant of our overall view of who we are, what, what the world is like, how the world works, what other people mean and the like. So, so yes. Uh, excellent question. One more question. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, I, I just, I can't, oh, <gasps> microphone, excellent. And we only have like a minute left. And I'll try to be really short. I'll make it quick. Please. Okay, great. Okay, and it sounds like what you were describing to me it reminds me of a concept of chaos theory, like Dr. Ian Malcolm describes in Jurassic Park. <laughs> so, what I was wondering is like, is the AI situation like a similar situation? to the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park where um, we essentially unleashed Pandora's box and um, sure. everything's going to hit the fan essentially. Yeah, that, so this is a, a multi-dimensional question. Um, and you're talking to somebody who, I'm not proud of this, I've seen Jurassic Park 32 times. <laughs> because for some weird reason, we've gotten to the tradition of watching it on every Thanksgiving. It is a great movie. Nevertheless, not 32 times. Right. So um, the, one of the steps that I left out, trying to compress and failing, was the relationship between it, the internet getting us used to chaos in the chaos theory sense, and how that primes us for AI. At the macro level, which, uh, which is, is it going to be a dinosaur that uh, eats the lawyers? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's something, 
it's a long conversation. There certainly is a need for figuring out how to regulate it. Uh, Jurassic Park had one befuddled owner, and we need more than, uh, I take befuddled over some of the current owners, but we need to be figuring out, and we are trying to figure out how to regulate it to prevent exactly, to keep the, the dinosaurs meeting us, the raptors in particular. If AI learns how to open doors, we're in terrible, terrible shape. Thank you so much, David. Sure. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>